Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello everybody, I'm here today with a guest who's going to talk about coronavirus, Dr. O'Connell. I'm very excited to have him here. Hello, doctor. Hi, Todd. Thank you for having me on your, your video and on your YouTube channel. Please feel free to, my name's Ted O'Connell. Feel free to call me Ted. Oh, thank you very much, Ted. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And with everything we see going on with coronavirus, there's just a lot of questions that as a mental health professional, I'm not equipped to answer. So to have a physician on the channel who can directly answer these questions or give it a shot, that's a great benefit. So I really do appreciate that. Well, I'm happy to be on on the show and and try to be able to answer some of these questions. You know, a couple of weeks ago, most of us knew nothing about this coronavirus and COVID-19. We're all trying to rapidly become experts. So I hope I'll be able to answer some of your questions. And if there's anything that I don't know, I'll let you know. Very good. So we'll get started here. So just to give the audience some context, can you tell me a little bit about like what you do as a physician? Right. Well, I'm a family physician, a primary care physician. My practice is primarily outpatient based. I take care of the entire age spectrum, do women's health, do procedures, and also spend some time taking care of patients in the hospital as well. My uh, overall practice is also a little bit unique. I run a residency training program, and that allows me to do some administration and also a lot of teaching with medical residents and medical students who are on their way in the health profession. Uh, we do get involved with some undergraduate students as well. So really pretty dynamic uh, professional career. And I write books and host a podcast and do some other things for fun on the side that fuel my professional interests. So let's move to, if you're okay with it, move to coronavirus. And I'll go through some of the questions that I've received that, again, I can't answer, but you might uh, have a much better chance of. And one of them I get uh, once in a while, and especially recently with the virus, is with primary care physicians, with family physicians, there's a concern that as the virus spreads and more people need some level of medical attention or assessment, that there's going to be limited access. And if somebody does have symptoms, they might be more reluctant to go in because they don't want to deny access to maybe somebody who needs it more. Right? So, um, there's a concern there, like, what can I do to not overwhelm the system? Any thoughts on that, right. on, the, on the idea of limited access and stealing services? Well, for one, I would say if somebody's taking that perspective, they are being altruistic and a, and a good citizen of our society, really trying to consider what's going on around them. What's going on in healthcare right now is there have been recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, about trying to move much more towards telehealth and telemedicine so that we are doing social distancing and really trying to prevent the spread of this virus. And the idea is to try to keep people out of healthcare facilities as much as possible, just so that they're not interacting with one another and even picking up the virus that may be present at that facility. And so my recommendation would be to not avoid care because people still are having issues with their diabetes. They still are having chest pain that needs to be evaluated. They still are getting appendicitis. They still are getting all of these other medical things that happen you know, even when we're not having a pandemic. But what my advice is, is to pick up the phone and make a phone call or a video visit your first entry into the healthcare system and talk to your primary care physician or the urgent care physician or whoever's helping to provide those services for the practice and get their advice on what you should be doing and then go from there. And they may tell you to come into the office. They may be able to deal with it virtually over the phone or over video. They may direct you to the, the emergency department. But by doing that, you're really minimizing the chance that you're going to come into contact with this novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Very good. Yeah, so there's a, a sense that we have like a risk-reward set up to where just running into the physician may not be the best move. Maybe making some sort of virtual contact might make more sense because even though you could have something wrong with you. You could also expose yourself 
or somebody else to that virus. Yeah, not only could you expose yourself, you could become a vector then where you take the virus home to a, an infant or to an older parent or somebody who has other chronic medical conditions where they're going to be at much higher risk and you don't want to serve as that vector. And that's really what we're trying to reduce. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. So now moving to a question I've received many times, and that is, what do we know about the attempts to create a vaccine for coronavirus? Well, I will first qualify this answer by saying I am not an immunologist and I am not an expert in vaccines. I did just have a very interesting conversation on my podcast with a virologist who also happens to be working on one of the vaccines. Um, what he has told me is that there are at least three currently in development. One is based on a an RNA sequence of the genome, partial sequence. So each of these vaccines are um, partial genome and partial protein uh, vaccines by my understanding of it. So they don't have the potential to be to convert into or to give any signals and act like an actual virus. So not only are they not live vaccines, they are not even killed vaccines. They're just a little piece of either RNA or DNA or protein that they will then use to generate an immune reaction in the body to build antibodies, but without ever exposing you to a full genome that could give directions to a cell inside your body. Fascinating. So, and you said there's three separate ones that are being worked on? There are at least three being developed. There's an RNA-based vaccine, and that's the one that they tested. I believe it was up in the Pacific Northwest at a Kaiser Permanente facility, and that was on the news within the last week or so. There is a DNA-based and then a partial protein-based vaccine. That's the one that's being worked on by Dr. Rosenthal, who is on my podcast and really where I'm getting a lot of knowledge about this, this topic from. Can you tell me about when you think that a vaccine could be ready? I know it's difficult to speculate on the topic. It is very difficult to speculate. Uh, from what I understand, I, I do know that that first RNA-based vaccine has already been given to a human. And what I was told by Dr. Rosenthal is within two weeks, they'll have some preliminary data on that. And the that can be scaled very rapidly, but there are a lot of regulatory and safety barriers in there where they want to make sure that it, that it's doing what it should, that they have the safety outcomes that they want, and then it needs to go into production. So for any of these vaccines, realistically, we're probably looking at 12 to 18 months in kind of a best case scenario. Okay. And I think initially when all this happened, the news reports, I, th I think the lowest amount of time I heard was two years. So that's shaving six months off potentially. Potentially. And again, I, I'm not in the industry and don't work for any of the, the companies or universities that are working on this. Um, so it, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. 12 months is probably absolutely best case scenario, at least by my understanding. Yeah, that, that would be remarkable and, and fantastic uh, if that could happen. So in terms of, you know, with the vaccine being 12 months, 18 months or more in the future, uh, social distancing has become a hot topic. And I've talked about it on my channel before, like the behavior and everything behind it. And I've had a lot of questions about this idea of flattening the curve. I think that most everybody at this point understands that the hospital systems can't handle everyone being infected at the same time. So if we can slow that down, we can stay under the level where the system can keep up, the, the medical system. But what about this idea, that, and I've heard this a few different ways, this idea that in the end, everyone's going to get infected. So it's just a matter of time. And then this other theory, which is with social distancing, maybe there'll be a population that never actually gets exposed. So essentially for them, it would have been contained. What we're really trying to do with social distancing is minimize the exposures overall for the population. We know that somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80% of people who get infected with this virus, at least by our current understanding, get relatively mild disease. 
And what we're trying to do is keep those who are at highest risk from getting the virus by not having people come in contact with one another, be vectors and bring that infection home. And really what we're trying to do is several things. One is, as you said, to not overwhelm the hospital and, and medical care systems, because if you do that, not only will we not be able to care for those who have significant COVID-19 infection, but everybody else who needs routine and emergent health care, we may not be able to address those needs if, if the system is overwhelmed. And also what we're doing is trying to protect those whose immune function is not ideal, either because they're infants or older adults or those with chronic medical problems, and buy them some time until we can get to that vaccine. And so then a combination of herd immunity by those who got more mild infections, and then those who got vaccines, and then hopefully let the virus die out um, within that. Although now we're hearing that this virus may just be around forever, but, it, but just like other serious illnesses that existed primarily in the past, smallpox, measles, you can get to the point where with herd immunity through native infection and with a vaccination that you can you can really get it under control and in the case of smallpox even really kind of eliminate it from the face of the earth interesting so so again the social distance is important for so many reasons it really is it really is so what about this theory that i've heard a few times and i think this is mostly based on people's experience with the flu so certain people have never had the flu Right, like in my lifetime, I've never had it, and I've certainly been exposed to it. Could anybody be immune to the coronavirus? Well, Todd, I, I would actually probably defer that question to an immunologist, but this is, there are other coronaviruses out there. Um, we had an epidemic of MERS, we had SARS, there are even other respiratory viruses that we see that cause the common cold that are coronaviruses. This is a novel coronavirus, and that is what is making it, it essentially has never been in human beings. And that's why it, it's creating such an issue, um, because there is no native immunity in any of us as far as we know. Now, could there be some people who got exposed to a strain that looked like this I suppose, theoretically, again, I would have to defer to an immunologist uh, on that type of question. So in theory, perhaps, but as far as I know, there isn't anybody who's immune to it. Yeah. So so maybe like don't count on it, right? So if, if it happens, great, but... I definitely wouldn't count on it. And I just said there's that there's nobody immune to it. There probably are people that are immune to it now, just within these last three or four months. But you know, pre, I, I'm answering the question as previously immune, and right. I would say you're right. Don't count on it. Very good. So this brings me to uh, the last question, perhaps really the most important. We talked before about social distancing and the benefits of that. What about the modes of transmission? What are we trying to directly avoid in terms of this virus transmission? Right. So... The novel coronavirus, COVID-19, is primarily spe spread through respiratory droplets. That means sneezing, coughing, secretions from the nose, saliva from the mouth, and, and that's really the, the primary mode. Um, it also can be spread through the fecal-oral route, which is actually a common way for a lot of different viruses and bacteria to be, um, to be spread. And it's kind of a gross topic, but just inadequate hygiene, not enough hand washing, um, you know, all kinds of things can happen, but it, it exists in feces and then can be spread that way as well um, through the gastrointestinal tract. There's some uh, question I asked a sports medicine physician yesterday on my podcast about whether it could be spread through sweat. And the answer is, to our knowledge, no. Um, but I don't know if that's actually been studied yet. Uh, I would ask the same question about tears. I don't, I don't know the, the answer about tears um, or, or other secretions, um, but it's primarily respiratory, secondarily fecal oral. Yeah, so better to avoid all fluids, I suppose, until we get um, more information. 
Absolutely. And, and then that's the idea behind the aggressive hand washing, the use of hand sanitizers, covering up coughs, using a, a mask if you are infected so that you're not spreading it to other people, um, and really just um, maintaining that social distance. Because the, the current idea is that, that, that the respiratory droplets can travel about three feet. And that's where the idea of the six feet of social distancing comes from. Um, there's some concern now that that this novel coronavirus could become aerosolized and exist in the air for a little while. That's especially concerning for first responders or somebody who's intubating a patient with the idea that they could be getting aerosolized secretions very close to their face. Um, but again, this is evolving very rapidly and our knowledge is, is um, changing and, and growing by the day. Yes. And that's a great point to emphasize uh, the, information like every day I read what I can what's available as I'm sure you do as well and and every day we're surprised by what we see right right something that we thought worked a week ago or two weeks ago um, it gets disproven and and then something else works or we find find out new information it's uh, it's almost like a, a baby growing up and just how quickly things change it's <laughs> a great way to put it so I'm so glad you could come on uh, my channel. These uh, the answers you provided, the discussion so helpful. I wanted to make sure that uh, I got a chance to talk about your podcast. You mentioned a podcast you did before uh, with somebody who had a lot of experience in is it immun immunology. Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, the the uh, guest on our first episode is actually a virologist, so he's an expert in in viruses and um, in immunology both. So he's uh, truly expert. Where could uh, viewers find that podcast? The podcast can be found on all major podcasting services like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Podbean, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. It's called COVID-19 Common Sense Conversations on the Coronavirus Pandemic. And really the intent behind that podcast is to provide credible information from trusted resources like experts in their field of medicine and virology, public health, epidemiology. And we want to give the public a place to go to get really good information to try to help maintain calm and, and avoid some of the, the myths and exaggerations that happen so prominently in the media. Yeah, it's not only a war against physical health, it's a war of misinformation that we've seen here. It really is. Is there anything else before we wrap up that you'd like to communicate to the audience? Well, I, I really would like to emphasize this idea of social distancing and thinking beyond oneself. You know, we, we see uh, reports in the news of people saying, well, I'm young and I'm healthy and this isn't going to affect me. More and more, we're finding out that it can seriously affect um, younger, healthy adults, but thinking beyond that to the other people in your life, the your parents, people with chronic medical problems, people that you don't even live with that you might transmit the virus to and potentially kill someone. And so really um, listening to the public health officials, taking this seriously. In the end, we might all find that we did overreact to this but an overreaction is actually probably the ideal outcome. If we step back a year from now and say, well, that was an overreaction, that actually means we succeeded in preventing the spread of this virus any more than it absolutely needed to spread. And really the worst thing that can happen here is an underreaction and getting the healthcare system overwhelmed like we see in Italy and, and some other countries. That, that's a good point. We already see the consequence of underreaction in 2020. Right, in in real time. Yeah, yeah, marvelous. Well, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. O'Connell. It's been absolutely great having you on here to talk about this subject matter. And perhaps we can do this again sometime as the story develops, which I'm certain it will. It, it is developing as we speak, and uh, I would be happy to come back if I'm useful to your audience. Very good. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comments section. And as always, thanks for watching.